Our lesson this morning comes from the Christian scriptures, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Jesus appears before his disciples in the middle of a storm and calls to Peter to join him in walking on the water. Hear these words from the New Living Translation of the Bible. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. They were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Will you please pray with me? Oh God, come to us in the quietness of this very moment. Center our hearts and our minds on you and you alone. Open us to the power and to the presence of your Holy Spirit and remind us that your love, mercy, and grace come to us unasked for and free. Amen. So in uh, his 1980 Grammy Award winning song, progressive country music legend, Willie Nelson sings, on the road again, just can't wait to get on the road again. The life I love is making music with my friends and I can't wait to get on the road again. All right, so I'm not a country music singer, no. Uh, I won't quit my day job, I promise. <laughs> But this week's scripture lesson uh, picks up right where we were last week. You recall that you know, Jesus here, is he, he's on the move. Last week we talked about his feeding the 5,000, and now he appears before the disciples in the middle of a storm. Now for those that have been to the Holy Land, you know that the Sea of Galilee can be just like New England weather. Going from sunshine one moment to a fierce storm the next. And certainly we experienced a fierce storm this past Tuesday with the deluge of rain that we received. So in last week's passage, I mentioned that uh, that, that story contained, was contained in each of the Gospels, which always causes us to sit up and pay attention to that. So it seems surprising that our on-the-move Jesus goes from one story that appears widely to today's story, which is only listed in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, I know uh, Mark includes the story about Jesus um, coming across the sea and calming the storm, and Jesus, uh, John cites a shorter version of that, and Luke doesn't say anything. But, you know, our Gospel writers are in agreement on the story they're all in agreement on the story of the feeding of the 5,000. But this story, which immediately follows, there's no writer agreement. Uh, 
a very unusual occurrence in the scriptures. So this story, I think, is popular in part because it is, it's personalized. It highlights someone who is, is experiencing a chaotic situation. And the faithful know full well the history of Peter, the brash, enthusiastic disciple who is always rushing into things, saying what others are thinking and doing what others dare not do. Peter is the first disciple. Peter is one of the three disciples who hike with Jesus up to the mountain where Jesus is transfigured. It is Peter who asked Jesus to explain the parables. It is Peter who answers Jesus' questions first. It is Peter who understands Jesus' true identity and Peter whom Jesus calls the foundation rock of the church one minute before calling him Satan the next. It is Peter who swears that he will never deny Jesus and Peter who does. It is Peter whom Jesus asked to pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter who falls asleep. So today's story has Peter being called by Jesus to walk to him on the water. And he begins to sink. Now Peter, he's the disciple that we can relate to because Peter's words of doubt, in Peter's words of doubt, don't we see a little bit of ourselves? Brian McLaren, pastor and leading figure in the emerging church movement writes in his book, Faith After Doubt, I too am a doubter, and I am a believer, and a doubter. Sometimes I flick back and forth five times in one day, and sometimes I'm both at exactly the same time. Now, I have previously mentioned the trend of people who have stopped attending church, a, a statistic that began long before COVID, so the pandemic is not the boogeyman. McLaren notes how doubt accompanies loss, loneliness, and crisis, but it can also be a doorway. He probes doubt in his book, not just as a deterioration process, but he calls it a growth process that provides us with opportunities to mature intellectually, spiritually, morally, and relationally. McLaren explores how to live with doubt as a companion rather than an enemy on our journey of faith. So like Peter, we all have our high points and low moments with Jesus as well as the institutional church. Being full of faith one moment, we can identify with Peter because one moment it's great and then the next moment there's doubt. So it's hard not to love Peter and this story. But then, you know, Peter cries out, Oh Lord, save me. Our, our feelings of regret, our internal feelings of regret and doubt aren't bad enough. That is Jesus' response to Peter. Well, those are words that hurt. You have so little faith. Ouch. Way to go, Jesus. Nothing like shaming poor Peter. Why do we doubt? 
because we're afraid, that's why. Who wouldn't be afraid? And seeing this scenario played out in what Peter was facing, I mean, I can relate to being afraid, sinking in water. I can't swim. Buoyancy is not a trait for some of us Morgans. My father, in fact, who served in the Navy during World War II, paid someone else to take the swimming test <laughs> because he couldn't swim. He sank straight to the bottom whenever he got into the water. And I'm the same way. So I can definitely relate to Peter's fear of the water. Peter's actions and words in this story are captivating. I mean, it's a good novel reading here. And like Peter, we're afraid. And that alone, boy, doesn't that scare us. But you know, this story, it's not about Peter and who he was. This is a story about Jesus and who he is. So let us not equate doubt with unbelief. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, our fears and doubts may paralyze us, but they are also what make us cry out for Jesus' saving touch. So how can they be all bad? If we never sank, if we could walk on water just fine all by ourselves, we would not need a savior. We could go into business for ourselves, she writes. Our doubts, fearsome as they are, remind us of who we are and whose we are and whom we need in our lives to save our lives. When we sink as Peter does, as we all do, our Lord reaches out and catches us, responding first with grace and then with judgment. Why did you doubt? But never with rejection. He returns to us, she concludes, he returns us to the boat, knowing full well the only reason we are in the boat in the first place is because we believe or want to believe and because we mean to follow him throughout all our doubtful days. So Peter experienced the ministry of Jesus Christ not from the safety and security of the back of the boat, rather from the stormy waters of the Sea of Galilee as it is outlined in today's reading. One commentator writes, on this reading, Christian faith is not about certitude and safety of believing from the boat, but rather about the productive tension between doubt and trust that lead us ever deeper into the mysterious relationship with the Lord who comes to us in the darkness and storm, who is present to us most palpably just when we risk something and begin to sink. Perhaps churches are emptying out because certainty is demanded, doubt and questioning is not allowed, and rough waters are raging all around us. I mean, let's admit it, we didn't sign up for walking on the stormy waters of this world, now did we? I missed that sign up sheet. In the coming year, our country will witness the turbulence of putting a former president on trial, and we are likely to face an election rematch of the century that will have people choosing sides and digging deeper trenches. Let's admit it, our world is a mess. Continued war between Ukraine and Russia, unrelenting unrest in the Middle East, an ever-present climate change, just to name a few. There is no safety or security in this boat that you and I are traveling. 
Jesus is on the move, and we should be too. And so, our Interfaith Justice Committee faced the volatile issue of gun violence just last Sunday, and they will explore the challenges of housing inequity next month. For those that read the Cape Cod Times this morning, Lawrence Brown writes a great piece, Civic Interest Coalition Needed to Solve Difficult Issues. He writes, here on Cape Cod, there are thousands of neighbors struggling desperately to make ends meet. New housing does them no good if they cannot afford it. Here's the thing, we can no longer have small groups of citizens concerned about nature in their silo and totally different groups who are concerned about affordable housing and decent life for the people whose labor serves us all. He writes, we need more than single issue groups who will disband when they either win or fail. We need a broad coalition of civic interest organizations bringing their various expert expertise about finance, hardship, and the needs of the environment, supporting each other. So we may be in a summer lull here at the Federated Church of Orleans, but boards and committees will begin to be getting back to work to begin the fall ministries and plans. So there is more to come. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, Peter had to leave the ship and risk his life on the sea in order to learn both his own weakness and the almighty power of his Lord. If Peter had not taken the risk, he would never have learned the meaning of faith. So while churches are emptying out, the faithful remnant are on the move with Jesus in communities across the globe, learning the meaning of faith. Because isn't that what draws us back here each and every week? McLaren offers a simple benediction at the conclusion of his book, modeled after the Beatitudes, to remind us that our honest doubts are not a curse, but rather a blessing. So I leave you with this. Blessed are the curious, for their curiosity honors reality. Blessed are the uncertain and those with second thoughts, for their minds are still open. Blessed are the wanderers, for they shall find what is wonderful. Blessed are the perplexed, for they have reached the frontiers of contemplation. Blessed are they who became cynical about their cynicism and suspicious of their suspicion, for they will enter the second innocence. Blessed are the doubters, for they shall see through false gods. And blessed are the lovers, for they shall see God everywhere. May we too be on the move with Jesus, seeking God everywhere. Amen.